reincarnated with the strongest system. Chapter 721, My Precious Panicked shrieks erupted underground as William made his way towards the Queen's room. No ants dared to block their way in fear that they would become the anteater's midnight snack. Kasaganaga looked at the running critters with bloodshot eyes. Its paw would subconsciously raise from time to time in a gesture that was akin to saying don't run. We are your friends. Soon, William arrived at their destination and all the rank B ants gathered around their queen. They were two meters tall, and their features didn't make them look like ants. They were like mutated creatures with six legs, and their appearance was largely affected by the beast genes that they were born with. Some had wolf heads, boar heads, monkey heads, and other creatures that were native in the forest. Regardless of what they looked like, all of their legs were shaking in fear at the presence of the rainbow-colored anteater whose drool was starting to fall down like a waterfall. Finally, I see you, Kasaganaga stared fixedly at the spot where the ants made a protective defensive perimeter. It unconsciously wiped the saliva that was pooling on the side of its mouth as an infatuated expression appeared on its adorable face. My precious! Cree! The ant's queen screeched in fear as her instincts told her that she was facing her natural predator. The warrior ants stood in front of her in an attempt to block William and his group, but it was to no avail. William stepped forward, and the sea of ants parted to make a path for him and his group. He also activated his appraisal skill to get additional information of the unique race that had the ability to evolve by eating the flesh of other creatures. Queen of the Colony Threat Level, B, Low Cannot be added to the herd. Requiem ants are a unique race that flourished in the Eternal Ever Garden. They are originally an inch tall, and three inches long. These ants are called the first generation ants. In time, they ceased to exist and were replaced by stronger variants that the queen had given birth to a few years later. Among the beasts that have the ability to evolve, the requiem ants was considered to be one of the most terrifying ants species in existence. The unique feature of this ants species is that no matter what form they take, the ants will still have six legs. This is the most notable feature of the requiem ants. There was a point in time, during the era of the gods, where the Requiem Ants Queen had reached the rank of a pseudo-demigod. She had birthed hundreds of millennial ants during the war and threatened all lives in the world of Hestia. According to the rumors, this Queen Ants was personally raised by the deity of the sky in order to provide it with a constant supply of food. Whether this rumor was true or not, one thing was certain. Before the era of the gods ended, this powerful myriad army disappeared from the face of the world, never to be seen again. The Requiem Ants Queen backed away until she reached the corner of the room. She screeched in fear and cried out for mercy from the anteater that kept on calling her my precious. Don't worry, I will properly raise you he he he, Kasaganaga tried to coax the terrified Queen Ants as she desperately called for her soldiers to protect her. However, the soldier ants stood rooted in their place like trees that were shaking their bodies as if they were having an epileptic seizure. Can you understand me? William asked the queen ants directly with a smile. The ants queen replied to William's question, and her reply made the half-elf secretly give Kasaganaga a thumbs up in his heart. Scree! Scree! Don't eat! Don't taste good! Don't worry! I won't let him eat you! I just want to ask you a few things! Scree! Scree! Don't eat! What ask? William asked the queen if she planned to invade the human outpost, and the latter admitted that she had indeed planned an invasion. William asked several more questions, and the queen answered them honestly, in fear that if she lied, the anteater in William's arms would jump at her and eat her without fail. The half-elf rubbed his chin. He was quite impressed by the queen's dedication to evolve her race to a higher species. Right now, the ant's queen was a B-rank creature. Several years ago, this was a creature that would pose a great threat to William. Now, he could easily end her life whenever he wanted to. But, that was not his purpose for coming to the ant's nest. Just like the elves, he understood the potential of the Requiem ants. This was why he wanted to integrate them to his king's legion because their upgrade was very easy to accommodate. 
the dungeon of Atlantis was filled with high-level creatures that could serve as the Requiem Ant's Queen's food. On the floor that William frequently explored, centennial and millennial beasts were everywhere. If he could feed the flesh of these beasts to the Queen, he would have a powerful army that numbered in the millions. It was not only Kasaganaga who was starting to drool, William was drooling as well as he looked at the Queen whose mouth was starting to froth. My precious. Yes. She is our precious. The Queen Ant looked at the two drooling devils in despair. She had been feeling very happy as of late because the evolution of her kind was going at a very rapid pace. However, right now, she felt that her ambition was about to end. She could only surrender her fate to the whims of the two creatures, whose presence made the entire nest, that had the potential to move unhindered in the world, tremble in fear. I will give you two choices, William said as he wiped the drool on his lips. Swear your loyalty to me, and you will be spared. Or, refuse and become this anteater's food. So, my precious, which one will you choose? Chapter 722 don't believe this anteater. He's just joking. The night on Antilia Island was usually filled with the sound of nightlife creatures. However, on this particular night, it was eerily quiet. Jophiel frowned while sitting on his balcony. He was sharpening his sword, and preparing for the possible conflicts that would arise before the ships from the academy arrived on the island. Right now, the ants didn't pose any immediate threats because their strength was still below the power of the people in the outpost. After a high-level meeting in the academy, the headmaster had finally decided to evacuate all the people in the outpost, and relocate them to a new island that had been prepared for their arrival. All he needed to do was to ensure that no unforeseen events would happen, and the outpost remained safe from a possible ants invasion. Jophiel assumed that William and the rest were already asleep in their rooms, because he could not see any lights coming through their windows. He didn't find it strange because they had just arrived on the island, and the information about the Class S mission had been delivered late in the afternoon. The head examiner believed that William would not be stupid enough to venture inside the forest in the middle of the night to try to finish the mission that was given to him, in order to pass the exam. I'll accompany them on stroll around the island tomorrow, Jophiel thought. Seriously? What can that boy do in a short amount of time? All of you are doing great. That's how you do it, William praised the ants that were entering the portal to the Thousand Beast Domain in an orderly manner. The bodies of the ants were shivering, not from the cold, but from the hungry-filled gaze that was being shot in their direction by a certain rainbow-colored anteater. In order to prevent any mishaps, William held Kasaganaga in a vice grip and was ready to stop it from having a late-night snack. Due to the Queen Ant's imperial order, all the ants in the island returned to the nest. The Queen had chosen to submit to William, and the latter immediately gave her the order to start a migration to his Thousand Beast domain. Three hours later, millions of Requiem ants had safely entered the Thousand Beast domain. In order to accommodate the new members of his legion, William spent a million god points in order to increase the size of his domain, and allow the ants to build their ant nest. He made sure that the territory of the ants were far away from the local beasts that had long treated the domain as their own. Although they were now all on the same side, William believed that it would still take some time before he could educate the ants and curb their mindset of treating any race, aside from their own, as enemies and food. Do you want me to give you a name? William asked the ants queen that had successfully relocated to her new home. The queen eyed William as if pondering this question seriously. She had never thought of acquiring a name in the past, because she had no need for one. While the Queen was pondering whether or not she should accept William's proposal, the anteater nestled in William's arms decided to voice out its opinion. I named the Queen I raised in the past as Queenie, Kasaganaga commented. How about we name her Queenie too? Then we will name the Queen after her, Queenie Three. The ant's queen then started to wail after hearing Kasaganaga's words. The anteater had already decided to raise another queen after her, which made her despair. Clearly, Kasaganaga only intended to fatten her up before going in for the kill. Don't believe this anteater, William said as he lightly tapped Kasaganaga's head. 
he is just joking. But, I'm not. Zip it. The queen cried bitterly as William and Kasaganaga had a verbal agreement in front of her. Out of consideration for his new ally, William decided to leave the nest after giving the queen some strict orders. The first order was that they were not allowed to hunt any of the beasts that were inside the Thousand Beast Domain. The ants had just arrived, so the other creatures inside the Thousand Beast Domain was still food in their eyes. The second order was that they would not attack, or provoke, any of William's herd or legion inside the Dungeon of Atlantis. After giving those two orders, William left to create a gateway, half a kilometer away from the nest, which was connected to the Dungeon of Atlantis. He already told the queen that she could send her warriors to scout the area, and hunt the creatures that were appropriate for their current rank. When everything was settled, William returned to his room using Solile and summoned Zhu, Sha, and Kenneth. He had already made Zhu and Sha part of his king's legion because this was what they wanted. Kenneth, on the other hand, promised to not tell anyone of William's secret. He was even thankful that William was able to trust him enough to show one of his trump cards that only a selected few were aware of. When William asked the silver-haired elf if he wanted to become a temporary member of his king's legion, Kenneth agreed. This allowed William to summon him just like Zhu and Shat, and the rest of his king's legion. Return to your rooms, William said with a smirk. I'm sure that when morning comes, Jophiel will definitely lose his composure. Zhu, Shat and Kenneth nodded their heads in agreement. They were also looking forward to how the head examiner would react, after he found out that the Class S threat on the island was nowhere to be found. A few hours later. Did all of you get a good night's sleep? Jophiel asked in an amicable manner as he greeted everyone in the dining area. The island doesn't have much to offer, but I hope that your accommodations were comfortable enough. William smiled as he sat on the chair beside Jophiel. I slept well last night. Thank you for the hospitality, Sir Jophiel. Zhu, Shat and Kenneth, also said similar statements as they, too, sat to have breakfast. Are you ready to tackle the issue at hand? Jophiel asked. Don't worry. I will be your tour guide today and ensure your safety. Not that you need it, knowing how capable you are, William. William didn't answer and simply nodded his head. He then started to eat in order to hide the smirk that was threatening to spread on his face. Jophiel didn't see anything out of place and ate in peace. There would be plenty of time to ask William about his experiences in the Tower of Babylon, after they toured around the island. An hour later, their group finally set out. Aside from Jophiel, there were six more men that accompanied William and his group. All of them were adamantium-ranked fighters which were strong enough to fight against most of the threats present in the island. As the group ventured deeper into the forest, a sense of uneasiness spread across Jophiel's face. The forest was quite lively, and the roars and cries of beasts could be heard everywhere. However, the target of their patrol was nowhere to be found. The hunters that Jophiel had brought with him were also looking around in confusion. They were already in the middle area of the forest, but not a single requiem ants could be seen. Only the regular flora and fauna was around, which made them feel that something wasn't right. William, and his group, on the other hand, acted like tourists on a field trip. They looked at the beasts that were present in the forest with great curiosity. Some of them were quite foreign to the half-elf. He was even tempted to bring a few of them to his domain, so that they could breed and reproduce. After walking for several hours, Jophiel finally realized that something was terribly wrong and raised his hand in a stopping gesture. Wait, Jophiel ordered. I will scout ahead first, and see if there are any dangerous creatures in front of us. All of you stay here and wait for my return. William nodded. Understood. Jophiel's subordinates also nodded their heads. They had been briefed beforehand to keep their eyes on William and his entourage. The half-elf and his companions were VIP guests, so they were their top priority. William watched Jophiel's back disappear in the distance. A smug smile appeared on his face when he noticed that the head examiner was headed straight to the location of the requiem ant's nest. 
Sorry, Sir Jophiel and thank you, William mused. Because of you, I have acquired a replacement for the undead legion that left with Malachay. Don't worry. I promise that I will properly raise them in your place. When Malachay took the undying lands with him, William's army had dwindled considerably. Although he had acquired over a million goblins from the floor of Genesis, the number of beasts under his command was almost two million. In the past, William might have been very happy with what he currently had. However, after taking part in the Battle of the Southern Continent, he realized that numbers also played an important role in wars. The appearance of the Requiem Ants not only brought him quantity, they made up for quality as well. As soon as they succeeded in their queen-raising plan, William would soon have a million-strong army, whose weakest member was that of the centennial rank. Chapter 723, Mysterious Disappearance Jophiel's frown deepened as he neared the Requiem Ant's nest. This was the headquarters of the ant's colony, and he was expecting to see thousands of them scurrying around their territory hunting for food. The only thing he saw were the footprints left by the ants on the ground. Jophiel was also an experienced hunter, so he was able to tell that the tracks were just several hours old. This made him sigh in relief because this meant that the ants were still around, at least, according to his assumption. The tracks all lead towards their nest, Jophiel thought. Did something happen to the queen? Jophiel shook his head and dispelled the idea. Right now, the requiem ants were in a stable path of development. Even if something happened to the queen, another queen would take its place, so there was nothing to worry about. I should take a look at their nest first, Jophiel mused. There is no way that millions of ants could possibly disappear overnight. This was what Jophiel told himself in order to calm his senses. He wasted no time and followed the trail that the ants had left behind. The head examiner was certain that once he arrived at the ants' colony, all of his worries would disappear completely. However, after he arrived at the entrance of the nest, his worries once again resurfaced. The closely guarded entrance of the colony was deserted. There were no guard ants. No worker ants. There was nothing. Jophiel gritted his teeth as he decided to enter the entrance of the colony. He activated his powerful senses to seek any form of life, as he traversed the underground maze. How can this be? Jophiel was alarmed after discovering that he couldn't detect any signs of life. It was as if the entire ants' colony had disappeared into thin air. This is impossible. Jophiel frantically sped up his descent in order to look for the queen's room. Although they had no information about where it was located, his exceptional hunting skills allowed him to follow the worker ants' trails, which would eventually lead him to the ants' nursery. This was where the queen spent most of her time, birthing the eggs for the colony. Half an hour later, he finally arrived at his location. Freshly opened eggs could be seen everywhere, which meant that the queen had still been active a few hours ago. The only problem was that all the trails led to the queen's area, but none of them could be seen going out. What did this mean? It meant that all the ants went to see their queen, and were never seen again. Could this be a rare case of cannibalism? Jophiel frowned. He held this idea for half a minute before rejecting it completely. No. Cannibalism cannot explain this turn of events. Even if this was true, the queen can't possibly eat millions of ants in a span of a few hours. This is simply unheard of. Something must have happened here, but what? After a brief internal struggle, Jophiel took out his communication crystal and immediately informed the headmaster of Hestia Academy about his discovery and theories as to what might have happened. The Requiem Ants was a dangerous species. If they had suddenly disappeared, it could only mean one thing. They went someplace else. The headmaster was alarmed when he heard Jophiel's report. He immediately ordered the head examiner to take all the hunters and scour the entire island. They must find the ants no matter what because they posed a serious threat to the world if left to their own devices. One of the hunters, who was tasked to watch over William's group, received an emergency order from Jophiel. He had tasked them to escort the half-elf and his group back to the outpost, 
before returning to the forest to meet up with him. The hunter found this order strange, but he still decided to carry it out since Jafil was his superior. The head examiner told us to escort you back to the outpost, the hunter said to William. I hope that you and the rest will cooperate with us and not cause us unneeded trouble. William nodded his head, but still decided to ask a question. Did something happen? William asked. He knew from the call that Jafil had discovered that the Requiem ants had disappeared, but he still decided to play his part and act like he was unaware of what was happening in the forest. Nothing of importance, the hunter replied. Please cooperate with us. Let's go back. William nodded and decided to not make a scene. He had already done his part, so making things difficult for the hunters would only make them have a bad impression of him. The half-elf knew that the head examiner would suspect him, but he was confident that the disappearance of the ants would not be traced back to him. After all, how could a single person hide over a million ants inside his pocket? They were also living creatures, so it was impossible to store them inside storage rings. After arriving back at the outpost, William and the others obediently returned to their quarters. Two of the hunters remained to watch over them, while the rest headed out to the forest to meet with Jafil. William sipped his tea in a leisurely manner as he calmly waited for Jafil's investigation to end. Zhu, Shat and Kenneth, joined him for an afternoon snack, but none of them discussed anything related to the Requiem ants. William had already discreetly informed them that they might be being monitored, so they just chatted about random things that had no importance whatsoever. Meanwhile inside the forest. This is absurd. One of the hunters exclaimed. They were still here when I returned to the outpost yesterday. Everything was normal and they showed no sign of a migration or anything. Calm down. Maybe they are still somewhere on the island, another hunter commented. Requiem ants don't grow wings. Even if they did, we would have heard the rustling of wings last night, since there are millions of them. The hunters calmed down a bit after this discussion. It was a known fact that the Requiem ants couldn't evolve into flying creatures. Unlike normal ant species that grew wings in order to mate and start their own colonies, Requiem ants were land dwellers. There could only exist one queen at a time in a colony and, until she died, no queen would emerge from her brood. Jafil half listened to their discussion because he was reading the information that the Academy had gathered about the Requiem Ants. He had read the document twice, but none matched the circumstances that they had right now. In the end, he decided to scout the island and search for any signs of the ants. He was still hoping that the ants had just migrated somewhere else on the island. Let's split into three groups, Jafil ordered. Marlow, your group will go to the west. Carl, your group will go to the east. I will head to the north. If any of you find the ants, notify me at once. Even a single member of the colony is fine. Do I make myself clear? Yes sir. The head examiner and the hunters looked for the ants until morning, but their search brought no results. After receiving the least news from Jafil, the headmaster of the academy finally decided to go to Antilia Island personally to investigate. This matter was of great importance to the academy, and he would do his best to get into the bottom of things, even if he had to turn the island upside down. Chapter 724, Confrontation with the Headmaster of Hestia Academy William and his group had already been on the island for three days. Jafil had no time to look for him because he had been busy dealing with the disappearance of the Requiem ants. They had already searched the entire island, but their efforts bore no fruit. In the end, they all decided to wait for the headmaster of the academy to arrive. They had already done their best, and there was no use sending more people out on a wild goose chase. Finally, the headmaster of Hestia Academy arrived, riding a red dragon that was over 10 meters long. His white, short, hair hung awkwardly over a furrowed, solemn face. His gentle hazel eyes were set seductively within their sockets. Although he was old, his skin was still fair, and handsomely complemented his eyes and cheekbones. This was Byron Massingale, the headmaster of Hestia Academy. 
William's eyes widened in shock when his gaze landed on the man that sat at the helm of the most prestigious academy of the world. William had seen many powerful men before, but Byron was different. The headmaster was practically brimming with power. It was so strong that it made the air fluctuate as he walked towards Jaffiel's and William's direction. William was very tempted to use his god points to appraise the headmaster's stats. However, he immediately changed his mind after Optimus informed him that it would cost him a million god points just to check the headmaster's information. For some reason, that person seems to be protected by some kind of law. This is another reason as to why it will take that many god points to appraise his information. If I were to make a hypothesis, this person is in a contract with a god, and it is not an ordinary god, but a very powerful one. William's eyes narrowed. Even without the appraising skill, he could tell that the person in front of him wasn't a pure-blooded human. His power fluctuations are similar to Vlad, William thought. Could this person possibly be a demigod? The half-elf felt that his guess was on the mark, but without spending his god points, he would not be able to confirm anything. After a brief internal struggle, William decided not to use his god points. He would rather use them to enhance his thousand beast domain, and make the lives of the creatures under his command able to live more comfortable lives. So, you are William, Byron said. I've heard many things about you. William smiled, and, I have not heard many things about you. Byron chuckled and placed his hand on William's shoulder. Tell me, young man, are you the one who took the Requiemance away from this island? Byron asked. His gaze locked on William's light green eyes as if he was looking straight into the half-elf's soul. William shook his head, no. I haven't even seen them. Is that so? Is that the reason why I'm stuck on this island? I've been inside the outpost ever since I arrived on the island. If you don't believe me, you can ask Sir Jaffiel. Jaffiel, who was standing beside William, nodded his head in acknowledgement. William did not step out of the outpost on the night the ants disappeared from their nest, Jaffiel stated. He has been well behaved and obediently followed the protocols we set inside the outpost since the incident. William stayed silent and acted as an innocent bystander. He had known long ago that demigods could tell if a person was lying. Because of this, he and Optimus had already set up a countermeasure that would prevent anyone from seeing through William's poker face. Byron stared at Jaffiel for half a minute before shifting his gaze back to William. How tall were the ants? Byron inquired. Did you see their queen? As Byron asked his questions, William felt himself falling into a daze. Some kind of energy was passing through the headmaster's hand that was resting on the half-elf's shoulder, making him feel muddled. Countermeasures success. Befuddlement resisted. This old bastard. William cursed internally as his jumbled thoughts finally merged together. He unconsciously unleashed the power of his Ain Herjar job class and pushed Byron away with a hateful gaze. William's hair turned silver as Stormacolor and Solile materialized in front of him. Although he didn't want to use the power of his job class because there was a chance of losing the memories of his past life, he would not allow anyone to have their way with him without his permission. Quite a hot-blooded young man. I'm just asking questions, Byron said with a calm expression on his face. Why are you resorting to violence? William sneered, you should already know the answer to that question, you old F asterisker. Jaffiel and the hunters looked at William with a dumbfounded expression. Byron was admired and respected by all the rulers and patriarchs on the central continent. They would do their best to form a good relationship with him and treat him politely. This was the first time that they had seen someone who dared to curse the headmaster to his face, and it made them feel like William was being suicidal. Byron sighed as he summoned his magic staff. You know, only Chloe can talk to me like you did in the academy. I'm only asking questions about the Requiemance. Why are you being defensive? Do you have something to hide? Yes, I have something to hide, William replied. I have many secrets, and some of them are enough to make an old bastard like you regret that you ever dared to use a befuddlement spell on me. 
Zhu's, Shaw's, and Kenneth's expressions became serious. They knew that William was not someone who would openly become hostile with someone, unless the other party did something to him. Now that they heard that Byron used a befuddlement spell on him, all of them summoned their weapons and stood beside William. They would definitely support him in his fight against the headmaster of Hestia Academy who was bullying a child. Even Jophiel who was standing on the side felt awkward. A befuddlement spell was something that made its target lose their train of thought and scattered their reasoning. This was a spell that breached a person's privacy, and was only used during interrogations. Although the Requiem Man's issue was important to the Academy, he also felt that Byron's action was out of line. If word got out that Byron attempted to use a spell to interrogate one of the examinees who was taking the entrance exam, the reputation of their academy would take a hit. This in turn might have a negative effect on the future applicants who might become disillusioned by the headmaster's way of doing things. Some of the people that had come to see the headmaster started whispering to each other. They were all refugees and outcasts that had sought the aid of the academy in order to find a safe place to live. They fled from their homeland because of abuse and suppression. The last thing they wanted to see was the headmaster of the academy doing this kind of thing to a teenager. If he could do it to William, didn't that mean that Byron could do the same to them as well? Seeing that things were getting out of hand, Jophiel decided to step in. The last thing he wanted to see was people losing faith in the academy, where he had served for almost half of his lifetime. Chapter 725, What Are You Two Fools Doing? Sir, I can attest that the boy is innocent, Jophiel said as he stood between William and Byron. He couldn't possibly be behind this incident, right, William? William snorted. He felt guilty because Jophiel was standing up for him because the head examiner thought that he was innocent, when in truth he was not. In order to hide his guilt, he decided to act tough and show his displeasure instead. This is what I like about you, Jophiel. Byron nodded in appreciation. You are not afraid to protect those whom you think are innocent, but in this case, you are standing on the wrong side, my friend. This boy isn't as guilt-free as you think he is. Isn't that right, William? Don't act chummy with me, William replied with contempt. Are we close? If you want to fight, let's fight. I wonder where that confidence of yours is coming from. Well, you are very close to finding that out. However, are you prepared for the consequences? The half-elf and the headmaster of the academy stared at each other, completely ignoring Jophiel who was standing between them. The head examiner felt awkward because the two were treating him like air. He didn't know what to do, and the spectators felt sorry for him. The half-elf looked at the headmaster with fearless eyes. Byron might be strong, but William wasn't afraid of him. He could summon Sun Wukong and let the Monkey King descend from the Celestial Realm and whack Byron to oblivion. There was only one person whom William feared fighting one-on-one -on -one in the world of Hestia, and that was his one and only sixth master, Chloe. After experiencing her might, the red-headed teenager was certain that even a demigod would eat a tremendous loss. No matter how strong Byron was, his threat would not amount to the threat Chloe could unleash with a full-powered overwhelming strike. Ha! Huh. What are you two fools doing? A familiar voice called out from above, which made William, and Byron, shift their attention away from the other. There, they saw a little fairy who was looking at them with sparkling eyes. Are you two planning to fight? Chloe asked with a big grin on her face. Why didn't you call for me? I like fighting the most. Um, old man, you are fighting against my disciple. Although two against one is against the rules, I will stand on my disciple's side. Come on. Let's fight. Chloe hovered between William and Byron with a very eager expression on her face. She couldn't wait to start the battle and start smashing things with her fist. Byron coughed awkwardly after seeing the little familiar who was looking at him with undisguised expectations. Just like William, Byron was quite afraid of Chloe because her strength was off the charts. There had been a time when he had received the violent girl's powerful punch, and it almost made him cross over into the afterlife. 
If not for the life-saving artifact that he possessed, someone else would be managing Hestia Academy instead of him. This is just a misunderstanding, Chloe, Byron cleared his throat as he unsummoned his magic staff. We are just chatting casually, right William? William ignored the headmaster's words and shamelessly complained to his sixth master. Sixth master, the headmaster is bullying me, William said with a face filled with injustice. I don't mind answering his questions, but he used a befuddlement spell on me. Sixth master, your disciple is being treated unjustly. Please, seek justice on my behalf. Chloe glared at Byron and raised her little fist in anger. You old coot, you dare to bully my disciple. Wait till I return to the academy, I will smash all of your collections. Chloe shouted hatefully, while William fanned the flames from the side. Chloe, this is a misunderstanding. Do you remember that super deluxe, ice cream that is sold in a limited number in the cafeteria? I will reserve two pieces for you every day for a week if we can forget about this matter. Byron wouldn't want to fight Chloe again in his lifetime because the pro-violent familiar was a cheat. Aside from her ability to break the laws of the world, her punch could literally blow up a mountain. Faced with these two combinations, Byron knew that his chances of surviving a battle with Chloe were non-existent. Only William, who had the same law-breaking skill, could match her in a head-on confrontation. The little fairy wavered because she could only get one serving of the limited, super deluxe, ice cream every month. This was one of the most popular desserts in the academy, and only ten people could eat it every day. I see, so this is just a misunderstanding, Chloe chuckled. Since that is the case, there's no need to fight. Violence is not the answer. Can we all get along as friends and walk hand in hand for the greater good? The corner of William's lips twitched when he realized that his sixth master had been bribed by a mere ice cream. However, he didn't force the issue. Right now, he needed to be listed on the rolls of Hestia Academy to finish Eamon's last trial. The last thing he wanted to do was to have a falling out with the headmaster, who was the head of the very academy that he was planning to enter. Still, he made a mental note about Chloe's weakness. He didn't know how delicious the ice cream of the academy's cafeteria was, but he doubted that it could beat the desserts that he could buy in the god shop. In the future, he planned to let his sixth master taste the sweets in his arsenal. That way, he could bribe her to help him do things inside the academy that he would not be able to do as a student. Byron glanced at William one last time before making a gesture for Jawfield to follow behind him. They still had things to talk about and do a final sweep on the island, to ensure that not a single ants was left. Although Byron didn't detect any lies from William when he answered his question, his instinct told him that the half-elf was lying. That was also why he decided to use the befuddlement spell to get past William's defenses. Unfortunately, the red-headed teenager was able to resist his spell and even decided to confront him openly. This made Byron more suspicious, so he deemed it would be best to fight the boy and ask him again after William was defeated. Chloe's appearance put all of his plans into a complete halt. With this, he could no longer target the boy, unless he wanted to risk facing the little familiar's wrath. For the time being, Byron decided to put this issue aside. With the Requiem Ant's disappearance from the island, there was no need to evacuate the people living there. Two days later, the ship carrying William and his entourage sailed towards the island where his lovers, and Celeste, were waiting for him. This was how William's entrance exam ended, having finally received Jawfield's, and the headmaster's, approval to enter Hestia Academy. Chapter 726, The Start of Your New Journey Begins Today Sixth Master, I was wondering, how did you arrive on Antilia Island? William asked. He could already see the island where they would dock shortly, so he decided to ask this question while the others were busy doing their own business. How? I flew of course, Chloe answered matter-of-factly. Don't you know? I mostly deliver stuff from the academy to Antilia Island. I can fly to it with my eyes closed. This is one of the easiest tasks there is to gain merit points in the academy. 
The little fairy patted her chest with confidence. William looked at her with a doubtful expression, but the fact still remained that the little fairy had appeared at a good time. Anyway, you don't have to worry about these things, Chloe waved her hand as if what she did wasn't a big deal. Since you've passed the exam, you are now an official student of the academy. Congratulations! As expected of my disciple, yay! High five! William subconsciously raised his hand and high-fived Chloe, only to regret it later. A loud clapping sound, followed by a pained cry reverberated on the ship. The half-elf had completely forgotten how strong Chloe was, and the latter was in an excited state of mind. Fortunately, none of his bones were broken, but his hand and arm hurt like hell. Using his life mage job class, William used a healing spell on his hand and arm. Sixth Master, can't you do things in moderation? Modi Deshin. William sighed in his heart. He had completely forgotten that the word moderation didn't apply to the little fairy who was looking at him with an awkward look on her face. Ah relax. Isn't it just a little sprain? Chloe patted William's shoulder softly. This time... She only used a light tap because she was afraid that she would break William's bones if she did it too strongly. You know what they say. What doesn't kill you, will kill you another day. Chloe imparted these words of wisdom before flying to the main mast of the ship. She had always liked being in high places, so she could feel the breeze brush past her small body. More than anything else, Chloe liked freedom. Perhaps, this was a trait that Celeste had wanted to achieve, but was unable to do so. This strong desire of freedom manifested in Chloe, which made the little juggernaut open to traveling long distances when given the opportunity. She didn't tell William that she went to Antilia Island because she was worried about him. This was the first time she had a disciple, so she planned to take this role seriously. When she saw that William and Byron was about to start a fight, she readily joined the fray and even chose William's side. Being a master isn't easy, Chloe muttered as she stared at the island that was getting closer and closer. Maybe I can ask Claire for tips later. She's smarter than me when it comes to these things. After finding a solution to her predicament, the little fairy sat on the mast and hummed a song. She believed that as long as Claire gave her the answers, she would be able to become a good master and treat her disciple well in Hestia Academy. Half an hour later, the ship finally docked at the port of Dream Isle. The first founder of Hestia Academy gave this name to the island, because this was the place where the dreams of those who aspired to enroll at the academy would take shape. Only those that had passed their entrance exam would be able to set foot on this island, and for most, this was a dream come true. William saw Princess Sidney, Ian, and Chiffon, waving at him from the shore. The half-elf grinned and flew from the ship to where they were waiting for him. Aya! Ah. A shout filled with happiness reached William's ears, and he felt something land on his head. A few seconds later, he heard Chloe's giggle, as she sat on the half-elf's head, using him as a mount to reach the island. William could only sigh in his heart as he flew towards his destination. Celeste covered her lips when she saw the funny scene of her familiar waving at her from William's head. With a glance, the beautiful elf could tell that Chloe was in a good mood. She just hoped that the little familiar didn't break anything on Antilia Island, or else it would be deducted from her pay at the academy. I'm back, William said as he landed in front of his three wives. Miss me. Instead of answering his question, the three ladies gave him a hug and kissed his cheeks. Seeing this public display of affection made Celeste frown because she suddenly remembered that she had branded the half-elf as a womanizer. Don't they look good together? Claire, who was seated on her shoulder, asked casually. It seems that he is well loved by his women. Celeste didn't say anything, but she had reaffirmed her goal to educate William on the importance of loyalty to a relationship. While doing so, she would also tell him about her sister's strong points. The beautiful elf would ensure to showcase all of Celine's good qualities, so that William wouldn't forget about her. Congratulations, William, Celeste said as he walked towards the half-elf who was having an intimate moment with the three beauties around him. Thank you, Professor, 
William replied. When are we going to leave for the academy? You're quite excited, aren't you? Well, it is my last academy arc after all. Why you're what? William chuckled when he saw the confused look on Celeste's face. This was one of the differences between Celeste and her sister. Unlike Celeste that got flustered easily, Celine was more confident in what she did. Even if William teased his master, Celine, the latter would just ignore his nonsense, and beat the crap out of him when they were training. Seeing Celeste's reaction, while having his master's face, made William feel weird. Maybe I can try making Master act flustered as well when we meet, William mused. I'm sure that she would look incredibly cute, just like Celeste. Tell me, what kind of exam did Sir Jaffiel make you take? Celeste asked in order to hide her earlier blunder. Even though she was a professor, she wasn't aware of the details when it came to the types of challenges that the examinees took during the entrance exam. It had something to do with ants. William replied and briefly explained what happened to Celeste. Princess Sidney, Ian, and Chiffon listened from the side and exchanged glances at each other. Before going to the Dream Isle, William had already notified Ash, through their connection, about the things that he did in Antilia Island. He told her that he should notify Princess Sidney about it, because he was curious about how the Ant Queens could interact with one another. Also, he wanted to know if Princess Sidney's beast companion was aware of the Requiem Ant's existence. The half-elf was wondering if either of the queens would act hostile when they met each other with their subordinates behind them. Although some ant colonies would immediately resort to war upon contact, there were others ant species who merged their forces together to create a super ant colony. Princess Sidney had received the answer from her beast companion, and the answer was that it was possible to form a cooperation between the two queens, on the condition that the Requiem Ants Queen would also form a contract with a person. Only when the two queens were bound would a non-aggression treaty be possible. This news made William quite happy. However, one problem appeared. He didn't have any candidates that could form a contract with the Ants Queen that he and Kasaganaga were planning to raise together. In the end, William decided to think about this problem more after he had entered the academy and started his formal education. I see. Celeste nodded. She was aware of the existence of the Requiem Ants, but she didn't think too much about it. Those who had passed the exam earlier, were getting a bit impatient because they had already been waiting on Dream Isle for days. The staff members that were assigned to look after them had stated that they would remain on the island until the head examiner, Jafiel, had arrived. Fortunately, the head examiner accompanied William to Dream Isle as well. Although there were many mishaps involved, it was now time to go to the academy. William thought that they would be traveling to the academy by ship, but Jafiel surprised him and the rest of the examinees, when he took everyone to a secluded grove where a teleportation gate was located. This teleportation gate is a one-way teleportation gate, Jafiel explained. This will send you to the capital city of Orion, where Hestia Academy is located. Once again, congratulations on passing the exam. I pray that all of you will become outstanding students, and contribute to the well-being of society. The head examiner then looked at Celeste and gave her a brief nod. Professor, I will let you guide the students to the academy. I'm sure that they are dying to get there. They've already waited long enough. Celine smiled and nodded her head. Understood. The beautiful elf then walked towards the base of the teleportation gate and faced the examinees who had dwindled down to 23 people, including William. Passing the entrance exam is only the beginning, Celeste declared with a serious expression as she scanned the crowd, whose eyes were filled with determination. The teleportation gate behind the beautiful elf came to life and a dazzling portal appeared at its center. Come. Celeste said in a challenging tone. The start of your new journey begins today. Chapter 727, Arrival at Hestia Academy Back on Antilia Island Byron stood at the center of the nursery area where the Requiem Ants Queen used to lay her eggs. He had decided to get into the bottom of things, and use his powers to unearth what had truly happened a few hours before the Requiem Ants disappeared from the island. 
The headmaster of the academy chanted a litany of words as the staff in his hands glowed with power. The air fluctuated as runic words embedded themselves at the walls of the cavern. After finishing his incantation, he tapped the ground with his staff and several images appeared around him. He used time magic and recreated the scenes that had transpired inside the nest several hours ago. I knew it. Byron snorted when he saw the half-elf and his companions talking to the queen of the colony. He watched the scene as they unfolded, and although the recreated scenes couldn't produce any sounds, he was still able to read the half-elf's lips and get a gist of what was happening. A frown appeared on Byron's face when he realized that the queen, and the other ants were deathly afraid of the beast that was nestled in William's arms. A pangolin. Byron muttered as he observed the creature up close. He had seen several of these scaly anteaters, but he had never seen one with scales that had the colors of the rainbow. Byron's frown deepened when he saw William open a portal and ordered the queen to send her subordinates inside it. The headmaster of the academy watched for a little while longer, before he waved his hand to dispel the power of the spell. I knew it, Byron shook his head helplessly. He's just like his grandfather. Both of them are bandits pretending to be saints. Byron closed his eyes and pondered. He was thinking of a way to resolve this issue as peacefully as possible. Jophiel shouldn't have brought him to the island. Byron sighed. I was also stupid for agreeing to his decision. We invited a fox inside our chicken coop. The lighting on the cave disappeared, and Byron was engulfed in darkness. He decided to return to the academy, and discuss the matters with his patron. Perhaps, the goddess of the world would give him some advice on how to deal with the presumptuous half-elf, who was giving him a bad headache. So, this is Hestia Academy, William eyed the gigantic castle in the distance. William had seen many amazing things in the world, just like the fortress of Avalon, but Hestia Academy even trumped the last bastion of humanity. Built on top of a floating island, it was a floating fortress that was several miles long. Perhaps, the most imposing landmark of the castle was the giant sword that was embedded at its center. Even from afar, one could see its mighty visage. From afar, the sword looked like it was made of white marble. However, after asking Celeste about it, the beautiful elf only smiled and said that even she, who had been in the academy for many years, didn't know what kind of material was used to build the sword. The only thing she knew was that, before the academy was even built, the giant sword had always been there, standing tall and proud for hundreds, perhaps even thousands, of years. Isn't it beautiful? Chloe floated in front of William and puffed her chest proudly. She was acting like she was the one that made the sword, which made William shake his head helplessly. Celeste made a gesture for everyone to follow behind her. They had just arrived at the capital city of Orion, and it would still take half an hour to arrive at the academy gates using a special flying ship that was exclusively used by the professors and students of the academy. Professor Celeste, welcome back to the academy, a pretty lady wearing light armor greeted Celeste with a smile. Are these the lucky ones who passed the entrance exams that were held a few days ago? Celeste nodded her head and smiled. Please, send us all to the academy. Understood. The pretty lady saluted and activated the crystal on her hand. Immediately, a silver ship materialized out of thin air. It reminded William of those Viking ships that he had seen in documentaries back on Earth. All aboard, Celeste ordered as she took the lead and boarded the ship that was floating a meter above the ground. All the examinees followed behind Celeste with their eyes filled with excitement. The deck of the flying ship was quite spacious, and it could easily accommodate over a hundred people. After everyone had boarded safely, Celeste waved her hand and the ship rose in the air. It flew straight towards the academy, and William felt a bit regretful that he didn't have a camera to take a commemorative photo of this magnificent view. Several minutes later, the ship landed near the gate of the academy. Several students were looking at the ship with eager faces. However, after William took a good look at them, the students weren't looking at the academy's newest students, but at the beautiful elf, who had a resigned expression on her face. Welcome back. Professor Celeste, a dashing young man shouted. 
it was the spark that made the rest of the students cheer and call out to Celeste. Clearly, she was quite popular in the academy and her fans were not limited to boys. Even girls were looking at her with infatuated gazes. Princess Sidney smiled and stepped forward. She was feeling very competitive with Celeste because their divinities were the complete opposite of each other. She wanted to show the beautiful elf that she could easily turn her admirers into her admirers in the span of heartbeat. However, before she could even enact her plan, she felt two strong arms wrap around her waist and hold her in place. Darling, what's wrong? Princess Sidney asked. I should be the one asking you that question, Morgana, William replied as he pulled the seductive girl to his chest. What are you planning to do? Just going to say hi to the students. Uh-huh. Then why are you brimming with fighting spirit? Morgana smiled as she leaned her body on William's chest. Why not? You already know that first impressions last. Don't tell me you are feeling jealous. Yes, I am feeling jealous, so behave yourself. The only one that needs to look at you is me. Fine. Morgana could feel her heart melting because William had whispered these loving words in her ear. She had completely forgotten her plan to compete with Celeste for the affection of the students in the academy. The seductress even felt ashamed of her pettiness. She was already married to William, so there was no need to compete with anyone. After thinking things through, Morgana decided to no longer antagonize Celeste. After all, the beautiful elf was destined to be forever alone because of her divinity. All right, show's over, now scram. Chloe flew towards the students and raised her fist. Anyone who is still here when I count to ten will receive a spanking. One, two, three. The students scattered and ran away like wild ducks that had heard gunfire. All of them admired Celeste, so they were also very familiar with Chloe. Aside from being called the Juggernaut, the students also called her the Albron and No Brains Fairy. None wanted to be on the receiving end of her slaps, spanks, and punches. The little familiar crossed her arms over her chest and snorted. Several students were infatuated with Celeste, and her role was to be the bodyguard that scared them away. Claire also stepped into this role when Chloe was doing expedition missions for the academy, but Claire wasn't as intimidating as her twin, so most of the students ignored her presence. Just as William entered the academy gates, he heard a ringing sound in his ears. It was not a notification from the system, but the sound of a handheld bell that seemed to be ringing right next to him. William looked around, and even asked Optimus if it could hear the sound of bells ringing. But, the system said that it couldn't detect any sound that matches William's description. The half-elf also asked his lovers, but all of them said that they were not hearing the sound of ringing bells. Half a minute later, the ringing sound ended and everything returned back to normal. William thought that he was just tired, and started to hear things, so he decided to put the weird incident at the back of his mind. He just followed behind Celeste towards the main hall where all of them would be briefed about the rules of the academy. On top of the hilt of the sword that was embedded at the center of the academy, a lady with otherworldly beauty stood. She was wearing white celestial clothes that fluttered in the breeze, and a handbell could be seen in her right hand. She gazed at William with a calm expression on her face for two full minutes before vanishing into particles of light. Located to the east, at the farthest corner of the academy, stood a shrine. No students were allowed to enter, and even the professors, with the exception of Celeste, and two others, were banned from entering its premises. A sigh filled with helplessness echoed from the depths of the shrine. It carried a sadness that would make anyone who heard it feel as if their hearts were about to break. Chapter 728, Class Introductions It had been two days since William's group had arrived at the academy. They had no complaints in the accommodations that had been given to them. In fact, they were given the best rooms in the boys' and girls' dormitories for some unknown reason. Usually, these high-quality rooms were only given to the head prefects of the different school years, but the higher UPS of the academy decided to bestow these privileges to William and his entourage, without batting an eye. However, the half-elf had one important concern, 
and he voiced it when Celeste invited them to an afternoon tea in her residence. Professor, there must be something wrong with these arrangements. How come are we not all in the same class? William asked Celeste who was elegantly sipping the tea made by Claire. The beautiful elf lowered her cup and glanced at William with a smile. This is the decision of the higher UPS. There is nothing I can do about it even if you complain to me, Celeste replied. Who decides these things? The headmaster, of course. William facepalmed because he finally understood why this was happening to him. Byron and him parted on bad terms, and this might be the headmaster's payback to the half-elf's reaction when he was questioned back in Antilia Island. Instead of becoming freshmen, everyone in William's group became third-year students in the academy. Princess Sidney, Ian, and Chiffon, were placed in Class A. Zhu and Sha were placed in Class B, while William, Kenneth, and Lilith were placed in Class C. William thought that he and his lovers would be in the same class, but it seems that the arrangement had been carefully planned by Byron, to prevent William's group from standing out. In order to vent out his frustration, William drank his tea and ate the cookies that were being hand-fed to him by Chiffon. Princess Sidney, Ian, Zhu, and Sha were also not happy with the arrangements either because they wanted to be in the same class with William. Also, Princess Sidney and Ian knew that Lilith was gunning for their lover, so they wanted to be in the same room in order to protect him. Lilith had no complaints about being in the same class as William. In fact, for her, this was the most ideal scenario because she could observe the half-elf during class. Looking at William's lovers, the Amazon princess decided to fan the flames in order to make the situation more chaotic. I don't think there's anything wrong with the arrangements, Lilith said. We came here to Hestia Academy to study. Since that is the case, we should just enjoy our academy life to the fullest. Princess Sidney glared at the shameless Amazon who had openly asked for William to give her his babies. Although she, and Morgana, did the same thing in the past, she hated Lilith because she was not doing it out of love, or lust, but out of necessity. The princess and her twin, Morgana, didn't want others to treat their husband as a tool. Especially a baby-making tool. Why don't we swap places? Princess Sidney offered as she smiled sweetly at Lilith. I'm sure the higher classes will give more attention to their students. Since you are here to study, going to Class A will be more beneficial for you. No thanks, Lilith replied in a heartbeat. I'm fine with Class C. I'm not some kind of privileged princess who constantly whines if she doesn't get her way. The two princesses glared at each other in disdain. Both of them were members of the Seven Deadly Sins. However, they didn't get along with each other, similar to oil and water. Will, don't cheat on us while you're in a different class, okay? Chiffon said as he looked up at William with eyes filled with trust. Of course not, William replied as he patted the pink-haired girl's forehead. How can I possibly cheat when I have such a beautiful and caring wife like you? No matter how beautiful the girls in my class are, they couldn't possibly match your beauty. Chiffon's smile widened as she was pulled into William's embrace. After experiencing the trials in the tower and getting married to William, the little glutton was slowly, yet surely, gaining confidence in herself. She was starting to open up to people and socialize with others. B1, B2, Scherer, and Bacon, also played their part in making Chiffon speak more and let her feelings be known to the world. Even Celeste, who was unhappy about William having many wives, had nothing to say when she looked at the half-elf, and pink-haired girl, who were hugging each other. However, she would surely be displeased if the one that took the little girl's place was Princess Sidney, whose very presence made her divinity pulse from time to time. The next day. Please, introduce yourselves to everyone. A middle-aged man wearing glasses said as he made a gesture for William, Kenneth, and Lilith, to come to the podium. The class became excited because all three of them were good-looking. The girls looked at William and Kenneth with starry eyes because both of them were very handsome. Lilith, on the other hand, may not be exceptionally beautiful, but she was radiating a youthful beauty that made the men look at her with earnest gazes. 
The Amazon princess was already used to being stared at by men, so she wasn't the least bothered by them as she made her introductions. Lilith Lin. Nice to meet all of you, Lilith said. Just call me Lilith. The men clapped their hands together, and some of them even whistled to show their support to their new classmate. Kenneth Xin Ashley, Kenneth introduced himself after the applause came to an end. Feel free to call me Kenneth. Another round of applause was heard. But, this time, the girls also joined and made the delicate-looking elf feel welcomed. William then came forward and scanned the faces of his new classmates before introducing himself. William von Ainsworth, William stated. It's a pleasure to be in this class. The classroom came to a standstill when William introduced himself. Soon, heavy breathing could be heard from some of the students as they stared at William in disbelief. Are you that William? One of the girls asked in disbelief. The one who conquered the 51st floor of Babylon and whose name was announced worldwide. Everyone in the room was dying to ask the same question. Fortunately, someone did ask, so they focused their attention on the half-elf who had a calm expression on his face. Yes, William answered. A pin-drop silence ensued that lasted for exactly ten seconds, before the classroom erupted into chaos. They were all wondering what the conqueror of the 51st floor looked like, and they couldn't believe that the same person was in their class, and looking at them with a smug expression on his face. Class behave yourselves, the middle-aged professor stepped in to calm the boys and girls who were starting to cause a ruckus. Most of them wanted to walk towards William and touch him to see if he was real or not. The middle-aged man was also the homeroom teacher of Class C, so it was quite easy for him to calm the students who were looking at William like he was their idol. Chapter 729, Tales of the Deity of the Sky William's face started to twitch as he found himself sitting between Kenneth and Lilith. When his homeroom teacher, Professor Garin, asked him to choose a place to sit, the half-elf immediately chose the rightmost corner of the room. Unlike the classes at the Helan Kingdom and Silverwind Academy that had a separate desk for each student, the sitting arrangement in Hestia Academy followed the herringbone arrangement, where all the seats were facing the podium at the center of the class. Each section was meant for three people, so William had no choice, but to share his spot with others. Since the three of them enrolled at the same time, they could only be grouped together. William was fine sitting beside Kenneth, but Lilith gave him the chills. Although the Amazon wasn't even looking at him and paying attention to the class lecture, the half-elf felt that his little brother was in danger, so he decided to swap places with Kenneth to remedy the situation. A flash of displeasure momentarily passed through the depths of Lilith's eyes, but no one was able to notice these changes. Kenneth didn't mind changing places with William because his only purpose was to keep a close eye on him. Of course, he also knew why the half-elf wanted to swap places with him, but he didn't care. Part of him even wanted to protect his ex-roommate from the Amazon who intended to drag him back to her empire. Professor Garin's lesson was about history. This was the subject that had made countless students fall asleep in their seats when he was still back on Earth. However, the professor's approach in teaching his class was quite interesting, that even William, who had angered his history teacher in the past, was listening sincerely to the lecture. They said that during the era of the gods, all the races were fighting for supremacy, Gareth said with an impassioned voice. Humans, elves, beastkins, dwarves, demons, Fairies, giants, dragons, gnomes, halflings, and several other races waged war against each other. During this era, humanity as a whole was the weakest race in the world. The battle was fierce because the gods themselves had sent their avatars, to fight alongside the race that worshipped them. Alliances were formed and alliances were broken. However, the most notable event of all was that only one god sided with the humans, and that was none other than Hestia. The goddess that created the world. Garin paused as he allowed the students to digest the words he had said before continuing. The class was composed of different races, so this was a touchy subject for most professors, but Garin wasn't an ordinary professor. He was a true academic that pursued truth, 
so even if he was dealing with a touchy subject, he was unfazed as he continued his lecture. When humanity was on its last legs, and total annihilation was only days away from happening, several heroes stepped up to turn the tide of battle, Garen said. The amazing thing was that these heroes who stepped up to defend humanity were not humans. One of them was the deity of the sky, Kasaganaga. They said that this deity would descend from the sky bringing powerful storm winds, heavy rain, thunder, and lightning. Those who saw its mighty visage would tremble in fear. Suddenly, a chuckle was heard inside the room, and all the students turned to look at William who was a second late in covering his mouth. I'm glad that you find my lecture very amusing, Mr. Ainsworth, Garen commented with a smile. Can you please tell the entire class what is so funny? William knew he was the one in the wrong, so he stood up and bowed his head in apology. I'm sorry, Professor, William replied. I was just surprised that a powerful deity fought alongside humans during the era of the gods. You still haven't answered my question, Mr. Ainsworth. I'm dying to know what you found funny in my lecture. Um. William was thinking very hard to come up with an excuse to answer Garen's question. The reason why he laughed was because of the professor's passionate speech glorifying the rainbow-colored anteater, who was currently doing its best to drag the corpses of centennial beasts to the Requiem Ants colony, in order to raise their ants queen. He just couldn't stop himself from chuckling as he envisioned Kasaganaga, fighting in a war against demigods, and gods, while shouting I'm rolling. In its adorable voice. Everyone was looking at William with pitiful gazes because Garen was notorious for punishing any student who made fun of his class. After thinking of many scenarios in his head, William decided to use the safest method in order to get out of his predicament. When I was still in the southern continent, I had the opportunity to meet the sky deity, William explained. Kasaganaga had been trapped inside a block of ice, frozen in time, and I was the one who set him free. The students, as well as Garen, looked at William with the nice try expression on their faces. Met the sky deity? Freed him from a block of ice? Ha! Huh. Do you really think we are gullible kids that you can trick with your sorry excuse for a story? Patui! William felt helpless because he couldn't possibly summon Kasaganaga just to prove his point. So, he just stood there and allowed his classmates to snigger and look at him in a teasing manner. That is a very good tale, Mr. Ainsworth. Professor Garin smiled. If what you said is true then humanity owes you a great favor for freeing one of our saviors. William scratched his cheeks in embarrassment. Um, instead of thanking me using words, I prefer to be compensated with gold coins, precious gems, and artifacts, William said after clearing his throat. Don't worry, I'm not too picky. Even though I saved one of the heroes of humanity, I am not asking for much. Anything of value will do. Professor Garen's face twitched after hearing William's reply. He was being sarcastic earlier about thanking William for his claim of freeing the sky deity. I was just joking and you were actually shameless enough to ask for compensation? You said you were not picky but all the things you listed were all things of value. You sure have guts. No one knew who it was, but a chuckle was heard inside the classroom. It was the spark that ignited the flames, and the other students weren't able to stop themselves from following suit. The men chuckled, and some even openly laughed. The girls on the other hand covered their lips and giggled. Even Lilith's body was shaking as she did her best to stop the bubbling laughter inside her chest from escaping her lips. In the end, Garen shook his head and decided to let William off the hook just this once. He understood that the latter had just arrived at the academy and was still adapting to his surroundings. Mr. Ainsworth, I'll let this incident pass this time, Garen said in a resigned manner, but next time, you'd better come up with a better story. Although meeting the deity of the sky and freeing him was an interesting tale, the great historians of Hestia would frown upon such claims without solid evidence. I hope that you will not make the same mistake again in the future, Mr. Ainsworth. William nodded his head and sat down. He applauded himself for having dealt with the situation in an amicable manner, leaving no hard feelings for him and Professor Garin. 
there was only one person in the class that didn't laugh, and that was none other than Kenneth. Deep inside, the silver-haired elf was shocked because of William's earlier tale. He didn't know that the rainbow-colored anteater whom he had seen nearly a week ago, was the same sky deity that Professor Garin was lecturing about. Just how many secrets do you have that I am not aware of? Kenneth thought as he glanced at the red-headed teenager with a complicated expression. William, who felt Kenneth's gaze, glanced back at him with a smile. Is there something wrong with my handsome face? William inquired. Kenneth rolled his eyes at the shameless half-elf, and once again shifted his attention to the professor's lecture. He was not in a hurry to know more of William's secrets. They had just mended their friendship not long ago, and he didn't want to cause any misunderstandings between them. Lilith, who was seated beside Kenneth, frowned. Her divinity was that of greed, and this allowed her to sense any kind of power, treasure or anything of importance to a person. It also gave her the power to snatch them if certain conditions were met. The Amazon princess could sense a very powerful artifact that fluctuated from time to time within Kenneth's body. But, for some reason, her divinity couldn't find out what it was, which perplexed her. Well, everyone has their secrets, Lilith pushed Kenneth's matter to the side because she didn't want to have any direct conflicts with one of her sisters, with the exception of Princess Sidney. There were no more mishaps, and Professor Garin was able to end his lessons smoothly. Right after the professor left, several of the students in the class rose from their seats and went to greet William, Kenneth, and Lilith. The three didn't shy away from their classmates and interacted with them in a friendly manner. William vowed that this time, he would enjoy his academy life and make lasting memories in Hestia Academy. However, somewhere on the horizon, far away from the eyes of mortal men, enlightened creatures and demigods, an important event was about to take place. An event that would make the skies of the world tremble, as a battle of great importance would be fought, in the heavens. Chapter 730, William, You Traitor Creation and destruction go hand in hand. When a life is born, another ends. Such was the cycle of life, and even gods were not exempt from this rule. It was the law that bound everyone in the multiverse. Within the void, a place where space and time worked together in harmony, lay the passage of worlds. Just like how the ancient humans on Earth used land bridges to cross the continents, this was a primitive method to traverse the cosmos and arrive at a predetermined location, according to the rules that were set in place. Right now, a raiding group, that numbered 3,000 strong, traversed these ancient pathways, headed to a world that was bound for destruction. The number of worlds that had life in the multiverse were countless, and these raiding groups only numbered in the tens of thousands. Even so, one thing was certain. When one of these groups reached their destination, a great battle would ensue. Once they had determined that there was a strong resistance in that world, they would send a signal to their main force, and the latter would immediately send an army that numbered in the millions. An army with one sole goal and that was to end the existence of all life on that planet. The 3,000 strong raiding party finally saw their destination beyond the countless worlds within the void. It was a beautiful blue world. A world that was filled with life, and yet, the laws of the multiverse had deemed that it was time to snuff it out, to give way to the birth of another world. Among those 3,000 harbingers of destruction, three of them had the rank of demigods. A hundred of them were pseudo-demigods. The remainder were all millennial rank at their peak. Just a step away from stepping into the myriad realm. Seeing that blue planet on the horizon, the giants of Jotunheim and Muspelheim increased their pace. They were looking at their destination with excitement and anticipation, because they were races that were bred for war. They were the army that had been given the task to destroy the worlds that were connected to a certain red portal in the cycle of reincarnation. Right now, that army of destruction was headed to Hestia. If they continued their journey at their current pace, they would arrive at their destination within a week's time. The countdown for the world's destruction had begun, and no more than five individuals were aware of the upcoming disaster that was going to befall the world that they were living in. Inside the Thousand Beast Domain Ruby 
I'm here. A rainbow-colored anteater ran through the tunnels of the ants' colony in haste. All the ants that were going along the same path as Kasaganaga moved to the side in fear of offending the anteater who, on several occasions, almost ate the ants that it had come across on the tunnels. Fortunately, Kasaganaga would only visit the nest after it had its fill of eating beast cores. However, that didn't change the fact that there was still a possibility of being eaten. In order to eliminate such risks, all the ants would stick to the walls as close as possible, and give the rainbow-colored calamity a wide berth whenever it passed through their domain. The Requiem Ants Queen almost choked as she ate her food when she heard the adorable, yet nightmare-inducing, voice. Half a minute later, Kasaganaga appeared in the Queen's cavern in a good mood. Here. I brought you some Class A beasts. Kasaganaga happily emptied all the contents of its storage bracelet, which it had received from William. Over a hundred dead beasts were piled up like a hill in front of the ant's queen and the latter could only shiver at the scene. Ruby found it hard to be happy, knowing that it was being fattened up for the slaughter. If not for the fact that William had promised to prevent Kasaganaga from eating her, the queen might have lost all hope and committed suicide. Due to Kasaganaga's diligent effort to feed her every day, the queen's body started to have a crimson luster. This was also why William decided to give her the name, Ruby. Eat as much as you can, so you can grow big and strong, Kasaganaga said as it rested its little paw on Ruby's foot. That way, I can hee hee hee. Kasaganaga was finding it hard to stop the drool from pooling at the corner of its lips as it stared at the crimson requiem ant's queen who was starting to shudder in fright. The worker ants that were tending the queen were all class A creatures. They ignored the anteater that was making their queen cry, and set about their work. Their job was to carefully dissect the creatures that Kasaganaga had brought to their nest, and prepare them for the queen's consumption. Naturally, they were also given a share of their own to eat, which had hastened their own evolutions. As an expert in raising ant queens, Kasaganaga was very patient with Ruby. It knew that it could not rush things, by force-feeding Ruby monsters that were above her class. Since her rank was only Class A, she should eat Class A beasts until she evolved into a Centennial Beast. Only after she had become a Centennial Beast, would Kasaganaga start feeding her Centennial Beasts as well. According to its estimate, it would take two weeks before Ruby reached the limit of her rank, and undergo evolution. The Crimson Requiem Ants Queen would then wrap herself in a cocoon and hibernate. The shortest evolution time could last a month, and the longest was half a year. Kasaganaga didn't know how long Ruby would take to finish her evolution, but it was not worried. With so many high-level creatures inside the dungeon of Atlantis, it was only a matter of time before Ruby stepped into the millennial and myriad ranks under Kasaganaga's guidance. I'm going back to the dungeon. Kasaganaga patted Ruby's legs in a friendly manner. Don't miss me too much, okay? Ruby's body once again shuddered after Kasaganaga's parting words. If possible, it didn't want to see the rainbow-colored anteater for the rest of her life. Sadly, there was nowhere that she could run. She only hoped that William would keep his promise to keep her safe from the gluttonous anteaters, and honor the contract that they both had signed for a subordinate and master relationship. William sighed in happiness as he rested his head on Princess Sidonie's leg. He was currently in the garden with the beautiful princess, and the latter had agreed to give him her lap as a pillow. It had been three days since William had become an official student of Hestia Academy, and one could say that he was living the ideal academy life. He enjoyed the classes very much, and had become friends with his classmates. Aside from the fact that he wasn't in the same room as his lovers, Everything was smooth sailing and he didn't have any complaints. Of course, he still hadn't forgotten one of his goals for entering the academy, and that was to accomplish the goal that Aemon had given him. The only problem was that the girl named Shannon, was under house arrest in a shrine that was heavily guarded by the academy. William had subtly attempted to bypass the area, but a powerful barrier prevented him from going further. According to Celeste, William would only be able to enter the shrine if he got the approval from the headmaster of the academy, Byron. Sidney, do you have any solutions to my problem? 
William asked. I don't really want to see the headmaster. That guy is bad news. Princess Sidney smiled as she gently brushed William's hair, and rubbed his chest with her smooth, and delicate hands. Have you tried to ask Celeste? Princess Sidney replied. If it's her, the possibility of getting the clearance is high. William sighed. She's being uncooperative. It seems that the headmaster has told her not to assist me in any way. Princess Sidney was about to say something when they heard a familiar voice asking for help. Save me! Conan shouted as he flew towards William's direction. Right behind him was a little fairy with short green hair with curls at the end, and grey eyes that were as calm as a lake. The fairy was none other than Celeste's familiar, Claire. Ever since William had appeared in the academy, the little fairy would often drag Conan away for an examination. Elliot, on the other hand, would wander around the academy in search of Chloe, and other beautiful girls that caught his fancy. Compared to the angelic familiar, William's little devil was like a protagonist that was running away from a yandera. Conan immediately dove inside William's uniform with the intention of using the half-elf as a sanctuary, to prevent himself from being harassed by the moody little fairy that liked to touch him all over. Claire, can you give Conan a break? William inquired as he eyed Celeste's indifferent-looking fairy who was looking at the bulge in William's uniform. Break? I give him plenty of breaks, Claire answered. I just want to see how he is different from us. This is important research when it comes to familiars. As you may already know, Elliot and Conan are the only two other familiars under the familiamancer profession. Also, I am aware of your difficulties in trying to enter the shrine. If you give me Conan, I promise that you will be given permission to enter it, in two to three days' time. William grabbed the hiding devil familiar inside his uniform and presented him to Claire. Please, take him with you, William said earnestly. Just remember our deal. Claire held Conan's arm in a vice grip before nodding her head to William. I will keep my promise. Expect to get clearance before this week is over. Come, Conan. We still haven't finished your physical examination. William, you traitor. Conan shouted in tears as he was dragged away by Claire. No. I don't want to go. I refuse to take part in your examination. William. Save me. I'll make it up to you later, Conan. I'm sorry, William replied as he said a silent prayer in his heart. Although he felt bad about Conan being dragged away by Claire, he knew that the little fairy had no intention of hurting Conan. He believed that the little fairy was just really curious about Conan since he was one of the first familiars that had been born aside from her and her twin sister, Chloe. Claire couldn't possibly be in love with Conan, right? William mused. Nah. It's impossible. Unlike Elliot, Conan was the innocent type. How can someone like that be appealing to girls? William chuckled internally before closing his eyes to take a nap. Now that Claire had promised him that she would secure a meeting with Shannon, the half-elf's heart was finally put at ease. He only hoped that when he finally met her, the problem she currently had was something that he could easily solve.